My journey with Ed started uh, eight years ago now uh, when he was doing clubs and small theatres and he had just uh, sold his first uh, headline tour which was a, a series of about seven dates around the UK playing a thousand seat theatres and, uh, and music halls uh, and I got brought on board to, uh, to, to, to be a production manager and sound engineer and he wanted to have some kind of production values to his show. So we started then so I came on board for seven shows and eight years later <laughs> we're still, still out there doing it. Technically it's not a very complex setup with the audio, um, yeah that everything emanates from Ed and his guitar and his vocal um, so that there aren't any complicated instruments on stage or, or massive orchestration uh, on stage. He, um, the loop pedal is something that's quite clever that was custom built for, for Ed and for us. Uh, it, we're able to loop multiple channels and I'm able to receive multiple channels at front of house. We've, we've, we've limited that so we've, we really only have sort of 13 physical inputs from the stage um, for, for the whole show. Um, but the way that breaks down into, into splitting guitars into sort of multiple bands of, of frequency bands of, of channels and uh, I do the monitoring from front of house as well so that duplicates the channels again. We quite quickly fill up the, uh, the, 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 the input box on the, on the, on the, the console. We're, we're up to 40 buses in and uh, 38 buses out. It's basically based on an Ableton looper um, with, a, with a, a bunch of custom elements to it. Uh, it this is quite, it's quite, yeah, it's quite that simple, really, in terms of its the, the electronics behind it. it um, we have a custom uh, interface which is built up from old Boss physical pedals because that's how the, the feel that Ed likes to have under his foot of the, the, the physical reaction of a Boss pedal. So we stripped all the guts out of the, uh, the Boss pedals and used the physical buttons. But yeah, the, the, effectively, it's just an, an Ableton looper. Ed doesn't require any complex monitoring. We have, we have uh, in-ear monitors and monitors, monitor speakers. Uh, we use both because he likes to hear the crowd, he likes to take his ears out and hear the crowd but still obviously hear what he's doing but also for, for, for more detailed parts like building the loops he needs both ears in so he really can concentrate on, on what he's doing. Um, but he likes it to stay the same, he doesn't want anyone to mix it, he wants it to be very, very consistent. So uh, it, was, it was a very easy thing for me to do, to set it up, leave it well alone and get on with mixing in front of house. Digico has always been my first choice. I, um, I, I, my, my initial things with Digico back in the days of the D1 and the D5 was they felt good initially. You, they, they, they feel like an analogue console, coming from an, an analogue background, I felt like it was still a, a very tactile console to use. Um, without too many complicated layers to get through, which some of the other competitors had at the time. Um, and as an added bonus, of course, the audio quality, I believe, is, is, is far superior than most of the consoles that were available at the time. I've stuck with Digico because they've been reliable. And uh, when I started with Ed, I was able to use the SD11, which is the smallest sort of 19 inch rack mount format. And, uh, and it has uh, grown to the other consoles as the show's grown and as the, uh, the input list has increased. I have a few yeah, choice bits of outboard. I use an Avalon 737 on Ed's voice. That's a go-to piece of outboard I've always, I've always enjoyed with a male voice. Um, the compression is very subtle and the EQ is something I can instantly grab without having to find his vocal channel on the desk. Um, I use uh, two Bricasti M7s, uh, one for voice, one for guitar. Um, they're just the most transparent, most natural sounding reverbs I've, I've ever come across. So I enjoy using those. And an even tied harmonizer um, for, for vocal harmonies. Really, apart from the Max Bass um, BCL that I use to either enhance or reduce the low end frequencies, depending on which songs we're using, we're playing. Um, those are the only bits of outboard I use. Everything else is on board with the Digico. The intriguing thing about this is it was not so much an upscaling as we downscaled it to do the arenas. We always had the stadium uh, run in mind. So we designed a show that would, would fit stadia, but we would scale down to, to squeeze into arenas for, for the year that went before it. Um, the, there weren't tremendously huge challenges about downscaling it. it. It was quite an easy thing to do with, uh, with, with the video walls being modular. We just took pieces of it out um, to make it fit into arenas. And uh, kind of the reverse on, um, on doing a stadiums, we're carrying our own steel. So in terms of things got easier, rigging got easier, although we're in different venues in different cities and different parts of the world. 
uh, a lot of we have a lot more constants now than we had when we were in the arenas. So in many respects, doing stadiums is is a much easier day than doing the arenas. Well, things have changed obviously significantly between the two. Is we had nine trucks of production on um, on the arena run. That's now 18 trucks of production. And the same thing kind of happens with crew. We, we started with a with a crew of 28. That we now tour in excess of 50 people on the road. Um, the same things change for our catering staff we used to used to feed about 100 people a day now feeding about 220 uh, our local crew requirements doubled mainly not so much due to the size of the show but the, the, the amount of pushing you have to do and the amount of plant we have increased um, yeah we went from having like 35 crew on a loadout to having 102 crew on a loadout for the stadiums so uh, we started start with getting stuff there we, we use kb event here in europe to do our, our trucking. Uh, Stuart McPherson and his team from KB have been with us for as long as I've been with Ed, which is eight years. We've, he he um, had our, our first small truck um, on, the, on the tour that now became all the Arctics we have now. Uh, we use Major Tom, uh, uh, an audio company to do order. Again, been with us from the start. Uh, Maya Sound Company, so uh, my choice of PA. Uh, we use kind of LCR, uh, gentlemen called Mike Oates, um, for our lighting, and Colonel Tom for our video. Um, I first started with the tour back in 2015 when they were doing the Wembley shows at the end of the Multiply uh, tour and I was working as a systems technician basically looking after the network and everything to do with uh, the communications of the fixtures and the consoles and at the end of those shows I got the opportunity to step into the role as lighting operator for the Australian and New Zealand shows and since then I've stepped into the role of uh, lighting director for the shows, uh, for the Divide campaign. The one trademark thing that Mark does tend to like to do, from my experience, is he likes to not have fixtures be an element of the show. So if you look at our set, all our fixtures are recessed within the set and they've got fascia cladding that basically tries to hide them from the view of the audience. The lighting isn't the key element and it, we've tried to hide and disguise and keep that as neat and tidy as possible. The main concept of the, the look of the entire show is essentially to bring just one man who plays with the guitar and some loop pedals out to a, a large audience, whether it be an arena or a stadium. The concept is that that one man needs to be as visible on stage to the people down in front as he is to the people as far away all the way up in the back. So Mark kind of designed the entire look of the show. Here's the show designer. And the mother grid and all the trussing and all that have been supplied and manufactured by Tate. Well, this is our, our set. At the moment, we're still putting it into place. We've been doing a bit of maintenance, but it's a, as you can see, it's a very 3D looking shape. Uh, we've got at the top what we call the crown, which basically is uh, the video and the lighting that is visible mostly to the people at the back of the stadium. The crown essentially is what you would normally consider your, your front trusses, I guess, your overhead trusses. They give you the, the ability to project your fixtures out towards the audience, uh, but they also give you the additional element of being able to tie in with the video crown screens that are already up there. So they tie in nicely with the video. Um, and the fixtures, essentially, they're, they're quite useful for being able to do the traditional look of having an audience or mole look. As we don't have traditional mole we use our uh, mythos to create that audience blinder look. And then we've got the ceilings that allow that video content that we create to flow down into the wall and the, the floor videos, uh, video screens. Uh, that allows us to create some 3D content that to most people or to the, to the large part, portion of the audience makes the stage not just a video, a, a standard video screen uh, at the back wall uh, and iMag, but it gives it the ability to create shapes that look as though they are growing out from the stage. Um, and I've, we've got pods, uh, Mythos pods, that controlled by Kinesis that during the show will be able to come down and change the look and the dynamic of that show. Uh, and they create different looks within the show. So they create a canopy and they come down maybe just a little bit. 
with these pods. Uh, the only additions that we've made to the show since have been an extra uh, meter and 1.2 meters in the video wall and the same on the crown. They've got great color mixing abilities. They're very fast, very punchy. The output for a 440 watt bulb is very, very good. Uh, with the new Mythos 2 edition, their dimmer curve is a lot better and a lot smoother than the, uh, the original. With all the custom waterproofing domes that we've got, their output is still very exceptional considering how much uh, those domes actually take out of the uh, output. Uh, so the kinesis moves that we do with the pods, they're there to essentially just change the dynamic of the show and chain, uh, create a different look. So having them come down uh, in some of the bigger numbers, it just changes the look of the show, changes the feel, changes the dynamic of it. It opens up the, the set so that we can get the lights that we have, and the, the senior unicos that we have hidden up within the mother grid to be able to shine through and create a different feel and a different look that allow us to push light through from behind and change the dynamic and the elements of the show. So from back here you can see the 16 Unicos that sit with up, up within the, uh, the mother grid that give that extra dynamic to the show. And in between each of those Unicos is the Martin Atomic LED strobe. So there's no heavy strobing that you actually see from front with strobes. That's all behind the set and it's more subtle and more used in keeping with the songs. The Unicus so far, I've thoroughly enjoyed them. We had uh, an extra eight uh, in the arenas uh, on the floor to give a little bit of an extra dynamic uh, and to make the show look a little bit bigger in the smaller venues. Their output is brilliant, their output is very bright. So this is where all the video content and video cameras are cut. Uh, video department sit here and uh, cut all the cameras for the show. And the media servers here project and send all the content up to stage so I trigger everything from out front over here and all the cameras are fed into the media server and then cut live by the video director for me. And we've got some robo cams that are able to control six robo cams around the stage so we've got little um, Bradley 2s that are controlled from here. It's about finding a fine balance that's not detracting from the look of the, visu the visual elements from the, the content, but also not detracting from the performance that is Ed. I mean, he is one man, so it's, it's crucial that we don't distract from that performance with too much light uh, and too much trickery with all the lighting. I mean, there's, with 136 fixtures, it's very easy to create many, many tricks, but we try and keep that as subtle and as as tied in with the video content as we can. It's important to keep you know, uh, a subtlety to the lighting so it's not detracting from that one performance uh, of one man on stage with the guitar. There are moments where we can utilize strobe and, and intense looks like that, but it's not a rave where you don't have a need or a good cause for using lasers or strobes or pyro. Everyone's come to see Ed, they've not come to see a lighting show, they've come to see Ed Sheeran perform and the idea is that the lighting needs to complement that man. Okay, so we've got 136 Mythos 2. Uh, we've got 16 of the Clay Packy Senius Unicos. We've got 12 of the Martin Atomic LED strobes. And we've got five of the Solaris Flare strobes. And we've also got on our delay towers 52 of the SGM G4 washers or wash beams and 12 of the SGM P10s. The delay tower lights, they're primarily to do backlighting for the audience, so they, they help to fill in uh, for the, the front half of the stadium and to give a bit more of uh, a backlight feel to those, that area of the show. Uh, they replicate as much as possible what we have going on in the rig, but primarily they're quite static. They don't, they don't move, they are essentially just color change or intensity chase fixtures. The show is uh, programmed in a very structured manner, uh, so I don't deviate too much from the, the program show. Um, it's important to note that the show isn't a time code show, there's no way you can time code Ed because things can change, things can happen, strings can break, set lists can change. So it's important that we are always able to reproduce and have a very consistent show and using time code would not be the way to do that. There are fairly 
live elements to it. Uh, for example, You Need Me, the final song of the set. There's a lot of stabs, a lot of um, live playbacks that I trigger manually, uh, as well as running most of the show on a Q stack. Uh, there are the additional uh, elements of using the flash buttons and temp buttons to create additional elements to the show. I quite enjoy the use of the layout view because it's very easy to be able to select all your fixtures. Uh, it gives you a, a visual representation of the rig that is in front. So being able to lay out all your fixtures in a plan view and being able to view them that way is very handy. It means you can look at the, what you've got there and it's a very close representation of what you have out there. Um, I also like being able to have the use of macros, being able to jump to a song is very handy. Uh, particularly with an artist that at times does like to change the set without warning. So it is very, very easy to be able to jump to a song and it's not noticeable to the audience if there's been a set change. It just works and happens seamlessly. Uh, also having plenty of playback space, particularly for songs where there's a lot going on, it's nice to have uh, plenty of room to have your stab buttons and all your effect looks. Doing a lot of the show during the day does, um, it, it, it's not always easy because it affects many things including uh, follow spot and the spot balance and because it is such a visual show the follow spots are quite important for the show because it means that we have to balance them and make sure that they're balanced to the right colour temperature and the right intensity so that the content that we have will work with the cameras. So it is quite important. Um, but the daylight does, uh, it has a, a small effect um, in that the cameras need to compensate for that extra light. And you do miss a bit of the effect from all the lights, uh, especially in the day. But by the time we actually go onto stage, it's usually quite late. So it's usually about quarter past nine that we go on. So at that point, we're well and truly past dusk and it's, you still get a full feel for the show. This is my preferred console. I've got one of my own. I personally own one. Um, I like the flexibility, the fact that you can set it up however you want. There is about a dozen different ways to achieve a single task. Um, so it's, it's customizable to each individual user. I have my own way of doing things uh, and I like that it is easy to be able to do the task that I like and I don't need to think too much about it. I do like being able to create uh, a list of macros that I use to uh, cut down the, my workflow and, and make my workflow a lot easier that makes it easier to get through my day, daily job of doing my focus, doing any programming I might need to do. And it does make, easy, make it easy at the beginning of a, a tour to be able to do that programming quite simply because you have all your macros right there that cut down a lot of the time in case something goes wrong with the other one. So it means I can easily just jump across to this one and go straight into the show if something goes wrong and they track each other so whatever I do on this console that console is obviously doing so if this stops working this one will take over and continue doing and I've got the same flexibility in the same same size console so everything's there for me uh, it's very easy and it just tracks about the show the media servers are triggered from the console so all the visual elements are triggered from this end of the, the multi-core uh, there are, there's a video department that backstage will mix and cut camera looks but all the uh, visual elements are triggered from me here. I have uh, a monitor here that gives me a look at what, um, I basically get a quad view that gives me all the different camera looks there so I can see when we're during the show how the light balance is looking, whether I need to add a bit more backlight, whether I need to pull down on some of the fill light. It just gives me the ability to be able to keep up with the video department and ensure that they're getting the look that they need to be able to create the effects and that the video that they're projecting to their screens is going to work. The joy of working with someone like Ed for so many years and going up from, from, uh, from doing clubs all the way to doing stadiums is we had a period of time where we had to use uh, various PA systems that were installed into venues or, or we went into territories where we weren't able to specify our preferred brand. Um, so I got to experiment with a lot of PA systems and, uh, and reaffirmed my, my beliefs all the, uh, all the way along really that the Maya sound system is most certainly the, the sound system for what we do with Ed. Um, it, 
particularly now, now it's really evident in the stadiums that you can go to the back seats of a, of a stadium and clearly hear Ed's, Ed's vocal and Ed's guitars and just being those are the only two things um, being played or being listened to is critical that they, they get all the way there, almost as critical as it would be for a comedian because without hearing all of it you'd, you'd, you'd lose the joke. Um, quite interestingly last night we played here in, in Munich and uh, we have a, a noise monitoring system uh, measuring for the council to make sure we don't exceed certain levels and they discovered that um, when I was 97 at the crowd barrier I was 95 at front of house and we were 93 at the monitoring position. Now front of house is 50 metres from the downstage barrier and the monitoring system was over 150 metres away from the, from the downstage area. So it goes to show what kind of even coverage we actually are achieving across stadiums. And I don't really believe that without an awful lot more hangs of PA system, we, any other system would do it the way that the Meyer system does. Our system comprises of main hangs of 18 Leo, uh, the side hangs are also 18 Leo. Uh, we have some flown 1100 LFC subs, we're using 9 aside, and on the ground we're using 12 1100 LFC subs per side set up in an end fire configuration. Uh, and this is supplemented by uh, 54 Milo as delays and then some Maya Sound Lena and Leopard as infills and front fills. We're using um, Maya's uh, new Galaxy processors to um, run the whole system. Uh, it handles all the time alignment, um, EQ, uh, phase correction um, for, uh, for all of the hangs. Um, and this is also combined with the use of SIM3 uh, which obviously does the, the analysis and um, analysis side uh, for, uh, for, for EQing and timing the system. Now, uh, we're in uh, Munich today. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely uh, lovely venue from 1972 World uh, Summer Olympics, uh, but an interesting one because it has a, a, a beautiful kind of glass roof all, all on one side, so it's a pretty much an asymmetrical space. Um, the big challenge in here really has been getting the right coverage of all the seats whilst also trying to minimise any reflections off the, uh, the glass roof. The, obviously the Leo is, is pretty good in that it's been able to get the uh, cover a good distance um, up, to the, uh, up to the sides of the venue. Um, but uh, we have in, uh, for, for this room just supplemented the, uh, our main system with some ring delays so we've got four hangs of uh, L Acoustics K2 um, just on, on the one side of the venue just covering the upper seats which has uh, been pretty helpful in, in, in uh, kind of creating really nice smooth coverage um, on, the, on that one side uh, and helping to keep, keep any um, extraneous uh, uh, noise from, from uh, reflecting around the venue. It was originally the choice of the front of house engineer Chris Marsh. Um, he's had quite a lot of um, experience with with Maya Sound uh, using the Milo um, and and really enjoyed enjoyed using it and then quite early on uh, was able to uh, try um, the Leo and found that it just really suited the um, the act and that he really you know we've stuck with it since then um, we have had the opportunity whilst doing um, shows around the world to try most of the um, the other sort of name brands on the market um, and just found that, that for us, Maya Sound has, has really fit um, what we needed to do and it's the most um, suitable choice for, uh, for this tour. We're using Maya Sound throughout um, 2017 for the Arena Tour um, and really uh, moving into stadiums, the, um, there's, there's an element of really just increasing the size of the hangs at the stage end um, and increase the number of sub base cabinets. Um, so our, our Leo hangs were, uh, we were using 14 in arenas with a downfill, and now we've just expanded that up to, to 18. Um, obviously the biggest change really is the, the addition of, the, of uh, four delay towers, um, which uh, given the size of the venues just was a, just totally necessary. Um, the, um, we've pretty much stuck with, with the um, the same front fill and sub configuration. We found that the end fire subs on the floor were, were um, really helpful in, in getting a good like, level of bass in the front of house area and creating 
uh, the smoothest coverage pattern we could get um, whilst uh, w without putting centre sub bass arrays which, which can cause problems with, uh, with Ed's guitar. Um, so it's a sort of still a left and right sub configuration but, uh, but the NFAR has been working really well for us. Uh, we did add, um, increase the number of subs we're using. I think we were using nine aside uh, last year and we've, we've increased it to 12. The same with the flown subs in the air uh, have now gone up to nine per side as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of it. I'd say in terms of the system tuning from moving from arenas into stadiums, one of the big challenges has been uh, first of all, getting the, the coverage everywhere. Um, although we've nearly doubled the amount of speakers on the tour, the venues have been probably trebling in size. So it's a, it's a, it's a big area to cover. Uh, so that has been, been one challenge. And with the space being so much larger, uh, just getting the, the time alignment of, of all the elements uh, to, a, to a satisfactory point um, has been um, quite quite a steep learning curve, as well as the adjusting the, uh, the for the sum summation of all the arrays, where you, you can be sat in seats where you might be hearing two or three different hangs, all with slightly different arrival times, and just trying to pinpoint a problem frequency and which hang it might specifically be coming from, or if it's just the, the combination of those different elements arriving, um, it's been quite an interesting challenge, but one that we are. Um, yeah, enjoying now. With a great bunch of people, that's number one. I mean, it's a, a great family to be part of, but also being a, a, able to travel the world and do what you're very passionate and uh, passionate about and, and enjoy doing. It's it's a great privilege to be able to you know see the world and be with a, a great bunch of people. I work for an incredible artist that I have a hell of a amount of respect for, and it's it's a lot of fun just to be out and do what I enjoy doing on a day-to-day -day basis.